are you today? I'm Dan Smith. This is God Talk. And uh, I've still been fighting a little allergy, but uh, let's see if we can't uh, talk about a tough subject today. <clears throat> but I hope that when we're done, it'll be a relief to you, another way to look at the character of God. I uh, had a cousin, married someone who at that time was not an Adventist, not not with us. He was a Christian to some degree, had had a tough life. So as they wanted to get married, we talked to say, hey, you want to have Bible studies? And so I came <laughs> to my church, and they were standing in the dark there, and he had the Bible open, <laughs> pounding away at it, showing her the opposite of what I was going to show them. Two hours later, as we looked at the character of God, he had completely changed his mind. And I'd draw charts and pizza paper. <laughs> that could, could we have those charts? <laughs> and they are together in the church, and I love them. They live down the street here in Loma Linda. Another young couple come to see me, going to dental school here in Loma Linda. Gorgeous girl, young men. She was the Adventist, he was not. Quite a conservative Christian family. But her parents would not <laughs> let them get married if he didn't come over her way. And he couldn't come. And he had visited pastors all over and someone said, why don't you go see Pastor Dan? Walked in here, <laughs> my office there in Riverside, and he was, he was not coming over the line. And as we start talking about not arguing who's right and who's wrong, about God, picture of God. <laughs> and I went over the traditional view, and then I added another little couple wrinkles of where I'm going, and you'll hear today. <laughs> this young man closed the Bible, stood up, <laughs> walked around the desk and hugged me that I had not had before from a Bible study. So happy to know that there was another option to what he had grown up with. And you don't have to have to give up the Bible or God to have something that hangs together that, that makes God look good. And you may not want to hug me when we're done. <laughs> and you may want to throw rocks. But I, I throw it out to you as an idea. My wife and I had just gotten married and I was reading through a devotional book and began to see another way. This is a book called His Healing Love by Richard Wynn, Dick Wynn. So anyway, let's see what you think. There's an old story. Dan Rather wrote a book called uh, Camera Never Blinks. He was a TV personality and uh, newscaster for many, many years. I think it's probably in his 80s now. So he uh, tells a story when he was in college. He worked in a one-man radio station. To go eat, you'd have to put on a 30-minute sermon. He put on a fire and brimstone Baptist preacher. Went off to get something to eat. He came back, and the owner's car was in the driveway. He asked the kid, uh, where you been? Went to get a sandwich. Do you know what happened while you were gone? And in that 30-minute sermon, it was a record, old records, that had a scratch. And somehow there was a... Scratch right at this certain point, and this Baptist preacher had gotten stuck shouting out over all the hills of Texas, go to hell, go to hell, go to hell, go to hell. <laughs> Too good to be true. No one wants to go to hell, but every religion in the world has a hell. A pope had to make a public statement here through the Vatican a couple of years ago because someone had written an article saying the pope didn't believe in hell, and they said, yes, he does. Rob Bell wrote a book called Love Wins that people wondered if he was still believing in hell. Pastor began to give it up back east. Got kicked out of his church. Netflix made a movie about another pastor who had 5,000 people coming to his church. He gave up the idea of God and hell. Lost almost all his church. Lost all his friends in the Christian Pentecostal movement that he was a part of. Interesting. What do we do 
with this idea of a fire at the end of the world. And Jesus died to save us from hell. Some people even say Jesus went to hell for us when he died. If Jesus died and went through hell for us, can we look at the cross to learn about hell? That whatever is true about the cross has to be true about the end. Whatever is true about the end has to also be true about the cross. If God is killing people at the end of the world, then did God kill Christ? What are you going to do with all of that? I am very proud of our church. We're one of only two churches in the world that doesn't believe that God burns people in hell every day. Us and the Jehovah Witnesses, who originally came out of the same bolt of cloth, gone far away from where we are. But we still teach that God is the one who does his strange act at the end of the world and burns and destroys everybody. People have begun to move away from the idea of God burning hell forever. What a tough view. And John Stott and other writers Christianity Today had an article a while ago with two different columns. The traditional view that God will annihilate. It's called annihilationalism. <laughs> a terrible word. We believe that all will be destroyed and not suffer in fire forever. Annihilationalism. And they listed all the writers that have come. Oz Guinness, Tony Campolo, various writers. Clark Pinnock who decided that God cannot be that kind of God. I use in my Bible studies 9-11, 200 people, they call them the jumpers, the 9-11 jumped out of those buildings. The fire was so hot, they would rather smash the glass and jump 100 floors and die like that than to die in the fire. Hmm. We think God does that kind of fire? 1,500 degrees on the top floors? In the book of uh, Daniel, Daniel chapter 3, it is not God who punishes people who don't bow down to him. It is Babylon. Babylon says, you don't bow down to my, our God. When the music plays, we will throw you in a fire. Heat it up seven times hotter. Be careful. But in our belief, it is still God who sends fire down from heaven at the end of the world. He wants to balance the scales of justice. And God hates sin, and if you sin, you will surely die. Jesus will take care of those who trust in him. But the rest of the people, God will still be the one to hurl down fire upon them, and they will surely die. God wants people to pay for this. And many people want people to pay too. No one should be able to sin. Hitler should not be able to do what he did and get away with it and just go to sleep. He should have to pay and suffer. Before it's all added up. Saddam Hussein and Bin Laden and Idi Amin in Uganda. You shouldn't be able to do like the Boko Haram and kidnap 300 girls and get away with that. ISIS, mafia, drug lords, Satan, the demons should have to suffer and be burned at least a little bit at the end of the world. And the character of God movement that I'm a part of says we don't think God is like that. That the physical fire at the end of the world is for cleansing, not for punishing. The wicked will die for other reasons first. Other people will say it differently than me, but I'll say this. Jesus died the second death in our place. There's only two deaths. I don't know any other deaths. Obviously, he didn't die the first death because we keep dying that death. My father's died that death, and I will someday, if Jesus doesn't come soon enough, I will die also. Now I'm 66 years old, and I'm going to die at some point. First death. So Jesus died to protect us from a death, so it has to be the second death. We have to say it carefully. I know some people are concerned about how we say that. So I believe we can look at the cross of Jesus and learn about the second death. Did God the Father destroy, kill his own son, punish his own son? Jesus said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Not, why are you killing me? 
John 10 says, I lay down my life. No one takes it from me. I lay it down. So even Jesus said it wasn't God who killed him. How can we have God the Father part of this one God killing another part of that God? Splitting the nature of God, splitting the Trinity, has all kinds of problems with it. I absolutely believe that the wicked will die. I do not believe in universalism. I believe God wants to save everybody. He is a universalist. But people somehow are willing to reject it. Hebrews 2, 3 says, how can we be saved if we neglect such a great salvation? Paul was worried that he would lose out. The Bible says we need to be faithful unto death. We'll get a crown of life. Some people choose not to. So I believe that people who sin and go away from God will suffer. They will not get away with it. They will surely die. And it will be as painful a death as the cross. It's so painful, the Bible says, that they call for the rocks on the mountain to take it, take it away from them, take them away from this suffering. They will not get away with it. There will be justice. But it will not be at the hand of a loving God who we say is good all the time. We say these things, God is good all the time, but we have parts of our theology where he is not good. We have to have a mediator to soften him up. And we have to have a God who kills his own son and takes out his wrath on his own son. And we have a God who stands by the side of the lake of fire and throws people into the fire. You have to be very, very careful. I happened to flip channels and see something for a little bit called Kill Bill. So I went online to read the story of what this Kill Bill is. Two movies together, four hours. And the gist of it is this girl was a part of a vigilante gang going around killing for contracts around the world. And when she was at her wedding to be married, somehow, because she was leaving the gang, they came and they shot them all and shot her. But she woke up in a hospital and she wrote down the list of the names of these five, I think it was. She went around the world to have vengeance and finally kills Bill. Father of her. I mean, the who was in a relationship with her before. Is God the same as the lady who was in the movie for Kill Bill, seething with vengeance and anger and hatred of all that have gone against him, all these people that have used his name in vain and sworn about him and says, God damn you, in all kinds of terrible phrases, who have had beliefs and religions that said terrible things about him, who went away from him, who ignore him, who reject him, who refuse to come and worship him, and God says, I am going to have justice. And he comes down and he throws them all into a lake of fire. I went online to find out how many people have lived in the history of the world. They will estimate about 108 billion. So let's just give some benefit to say maybe 8 billion make it. The Bible says a few will make it. But also it says the multitude that no one could number. So let's say it's 8 billion just for a number. That leaves 100 billion. Do we really believe that God comes down from heaven, stands here by the side of the lake of fire, and Jesus and the Father and the Holy Spirit throw them in a fire? Is that what God wants us to share with the world? Jesus comes down and he says one verse, thieves come to steal and destroy and take life. I am not a thief. I don't take life. I came to give you life. John 10, 10. What are we going to do with that? God take the life of his son at the cross. God take the life of the wicked at the end of the world. Be careful. What about Matthew chapter 8, 28 and 29? Jesus comes in a boat, meets these men who are filled with demons, and the demons cry out, have you come to torture us? No fire. Same Greek word as in Revelation 14, the smoke of the torment rises up day and night. Evidently to be in the presence of Jesus who is only love and your evil and demonic feels like torture. No fire. It hurts like fire. And the wicked call for the rocks and the mountains to fall on them because it hurts like fire fire 
Herb Montgomery, I don't agree with everything Herb Montgomery says, but he said some really profound things in an article he wrote about the fire in the book called The Servant God. And he says that in the Song of Solomon, there are these verses talking about pure love that, when it's rejected, feels like fire. Hmm. Interesting. Mark Wittes was pastor at PUC for a while. I heard a great sermon by him at the One Project. He put up on the screen these metaphors that are in the book of Revelation. The sickle that will come in and have the judgment. And there will be the harvest of the grapes of wrath and the wheat harvest. Grapes and the wine press. So we have the sickle, grapes and the wine press crushing the grapes. And we have the supper for the birds. And everyone understands those to be metaphors. Grapes being crushed, metaphor. Sickle in the harvest, metaphor. The supper for the birds. But somehow out of these four metaphors, the lake of fire, we make three metaphor and one we take literally. Why? Why? Why not all four? And so we, trying to be consistent to say that God is good all the time, have to question whether that's really the truth about God. Could it be that God was telling the truth when he said at the tree, if you eat of the tree, you will surely die? Not because he would kill anybody. He's giving a loving warning to say, if you leave me, I'm the only source of life there is in the universe. And if you leave me, you will surely die. Don't leave me. Jesus come down to die on a cross and say, let me show you what happens with sin. Sin is lethal. Sin will kill you. Be careful. Doesn't want anybody to die. But no one will know until the end of the thousand years when they finally die the second death. Too late then for all this time in a thousand years. Do you think they're going to be Okay. God said, I want you to wait till then till you find out the truth. I want you to learn the truth now. Look at the cross. Settle it. If you're the tree, you will surely die. I'm the only source of life there is. So some people will die because they say to God, you stay out of my life. We don't want you. We don't need you. We don't need your religion. We don't need your rules. We don't need your church. We don't want to pay tithe. We don't want to keep your Sabbath. We don't want to do anything with you. Stay out of our life. God says, you will die. No, we don't think so. We'll take a chance on that. Satan said, you will not surely die. I'm alive. Follow me. You'll be like God's. And they die because they reject life. You unplug the TV, the power goes out. Every time you go vacuum, somehow they make the cords two feet shorter than your room. You can vacuum the whole room to get to the end, and just at the last minute, you're going to do the last little bit. The vacuum cord comes out, and you got to go back and move it. I preached about that. Someone came and brought me an extension cord. <laughs> you unplug, you will surely die. You disconnect from God. And God says, I warned you. You tell the scuba diver, make sure you keep the air tight connection. Watch your gauge. When you have 500 pounds pressure, start with 3,000. Get down to 500. Come up. Boy, we all teach that. Every few minutes, they're checking. Check your gauge. You okay? Yes, I'm okay. 500, you come up. You go against that. You look at the fish down there. They don't need any mask. They don't need any air. I think I can do it. You take your regulator off. You will surely die. Not because you broke some law and they said, you, you broke our laws. I'm going to kill you. You broke a reality that you cannot live down at the bottom of the ocean without air from above. Be careful. Other people will die because they kill each other. It's in the Bible. They'd come outside sometimes and they hadn't killed anybody. They're all dead, killed each other. They had a battle one time under David, 12 on each side. And they all took a sword in each other and all 24 died. All killed each other. Revelation 17 says, when the kings of the whole kings of the whole world turned against the prostitute woman 
and there's war between these two sides, both on the evil side. People will die. Daniel 3, Babylon kills Babylonians. Babylonians tried to kill the three young friends of Daniel. God saves them, and the Babylonians died, killed by Babylonians in the fire. So some will die. Some will die because they reject life. Some will die because they killed each other. Too bad. Here are some quotes to consider. If you're an Adventist and you respect the writings of Ellen G. White, if you're not, just leave this part out. Christ's Optic Lessons, page 84. God destroys no man. <clears throat> Everyone who is destroyed will have destroyed himself. Desire of Ages 764. This is not an act of arbitrary power on the part of God. They reject his mercy. They reap that which they have sown. God is the fountain of life, and one separates from God. They cut themselves off from life. Great Controversy, page 36. God does not stand toward the sinner as an executioner of the sentence against transgression, but he leaves the rejecters of his mercy to themselves. Very clear. I wrestled hard with the idea of the face of God. David kept asking for God to show us your face. Show us your face, God. Moses wanted to see the face of God. Your face stands for who you are. The rest of your body, that's just you. Your face is who you are. Recognize you as different from everybody else. And God, David says, I want your face. Turn your face. Why do you turn your face away from us? And I wrestled with what will the wicked see when they see the face of Jesus and God on the cloud. Are there two faces of God? Have they seen that face of kindness and grace and the cross of Jesus? But now there's justice coming with a sickle. I kept thinking <clears throat> about Peter. Jesus says, you'll deny me. Peter, I will never deny you. How could I deny you? Before the cock crows, you will deny me three times. Peter denies. The lady comes and says, you're one of them. He says, I have nothing to do with them. I don't know them. The third time, the cock crows, and Peter remembers, and he looks up, and he sees the face of Jesus. If anybody deserves the frown, when I grew up, I, my mother could frown. You didn't do right. My mother could frown, world-class frown. Does God frown? Is there anger in the face of Jesus? And Desire of Ages says in page 713, Peter's eyes were drawn to his master. In that gentle countenance, he read deep pity and sorrow, but there was no anger there. And that look of compassion and forgiveness pierced his heart like an arrow, and he rushed heartbroken from the hall. It was torture to his bleeding heart. He fell on his face and wished to die. That's what the wicked will see when they see the face of Jesus. He doesn't have two faces. He is only one face. He is only good. He is good all the time. His only goodness, 2 Corinthians 1.20, he is yes all the time. I preach a sermon on always yes. But that face of love will make people heartbroken and they will wish to die and call for the rocks and the mountains to come. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6, God made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the glory of God in the face of Christ. There will only be the glory of God in the face of Christ, the radiance of his glory, Hebrews 1, 3. The exact representation of his being is not changed. God says, I change not. Sin never changes the heart of God. Be careful. In 2 Corinthians, in the desire of ages, Page 20, it says, It will be seen that this glory in the face of Jesus is the glory of self-sacrificing love. God never changes. You don't have to be afraid of God. Not going to hurl fire down on us, only to cleanse the world after everyone has died. And then I go to the Red Sea. We're going to sing the song of Moses at the end of the world. Let's go see what the song of Moses is. God did a miracle. The Egyptians are coming. There are mountains on both sides. 
And there's the Red Sea. God's opened up the Red Sea. He said, use your rod and open up the Red Sea. And they go across. God has opened the way to the promised land. Now Egyptians run into that same sea with their chariots and their horses and their army. And God says, put the rod again. And the waters go back to where they were. And all the Egyptians are destroyed. And Miriam takes out a tambourine and all the women begin to dance and celebrate God and they sing the song of Moses. And it says in Exodus 15, the Lord has hurled the horse and rider into the sea. Hurled. Where was the hurling? God did not take horses and armies and soldiers and chariots and hurl them into the sea. They went there on their own. All God did... When people did not want him and reject him, he lets the miracle go back to what it was. He gives life to those who want it. They don't want his life. Okay, he lets it go. And the waters go back where they were, and the people died. It's called primary causation and secondary causation. Primary causation is when you kill something. You punish and you kill. Secondary, you step back, and this happens. God did not kill. God lets people go. Romans 1. God lets people go to the choices. You want their choice? I will respect your choice. Your choice is to live apart from life. God will, okay, I will not force myself on you. You will die. No, we don't think so. So you will have to decide what you believe. We believe at the end of the world. God is going to show that video at the end of the thousand years, great white throne judgment. You will see the cross. Everyone will begin to worship. The Bible says every knee will bow, every tongue will confess. The righteous will bow, the angels will bow, the demons will bow, the wicked will bow, Satan will bow. And everyone will bow. And they will be lost. The vote will be 108 billion to zero. God does not stop and say, give me a couple of minutes here, everybody. After he has spent thousands of years to win us over to him and everybody is worshiping him, that he is right and he is love. And now he's going to now destroy 100 billion people and expect people to love and trust him forever? Don't think so. Hard to understand that God would be willing to undo all his victory that he'd finally won. He wants us to trust him. Now the wicked will die because they reject God. And God will make a new earth. And we will know better because we have seen the reality. Anyway, you think about it, and you will have to decide we stand for this. God is good all the time. All the time, God is good. Pray about it. Think about it. This is God talk.